Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, Rich. And welcome and thank you for joining Reps and Sertara for today's presentation, Navigating Today's Regulatory Trends to Successfully Manage ECTD Submissions. Before I introduce our webinar goals and speakers, I'd like to provide a quick overview of Sertara. So who is Sertara? Sertara optimizes R&D productivity, commercial value, and patient outcomes through its unique portfolio of model-informed drug development, market access, and regulatory science solutions, which includes regulatory submission software and services. Our clients include 1,600 global biopharmaceutical companies, leading academic institutions, and key regulatory agencies across 60 countries. So without further ado, let me get right into our webinar goals for today. So our subject matter experts will cover three main topics. First, to review the top five trends we're seeing across our clients and their ECTD submissions. Second, to discuss the challenges and risks presented by each of these trends. And lastly, to provide strategies and technologies to overcome challenges and mitigate risks. Now at this time, I'd like to introduce you all to our speakers for today's presentation. Both of our subject matter experts come from Synchrogenics, a Sutara company that helps accelerate the regulatory submissions of medical innovations worldwide and through customized regulatory strategies, operations, and technology. Rob Labriola, Senior Director of Regulatory Services, has over 25 years of experience with regulatory submissions in the pharmaceutical industry. He has been involved in the production of electronic regulatory submissions to numerous health agencies at all roles and leadership levels. Evan Richardson, Director of Regulatory Services, has over 15 years of experience with regulatory submissions for pharmaceuticals, biologics, medical devices, and other product categories. He served in roles at all levels for service providers and in industry. So to kick off today's topic, I'd like to go ahead and welcome Rob to begin the presentation. All right, thanks, Danny. This is Evan. It's actually going to be me leading things off, so I uh, appreciate the introduction there. Thank you, and I'll uh, look for control here so I can advance the slides. There we go. All right, so I'm just going to jump right in here. Uh, again, we're going to talk about the top five trends we're seeing across our clients, and the first uh, big trend we're seeing uh, are rolling NDA and BLA submissions. And um, just to start off with, uh, let me make sure I explain what that is for folks who may not be familiar with it. So uh, a, a standard NDA timeline is going to look something like this. It's just one continuous timeline, start to finish. Um, all your modules one through five are included, and everything gets to the agency at the end of that timeline. Uh, when you click the submit button and upload through the ESG. For a rolling NDA submission, um, and this will also be true for a BLA, um, you, you know, you're going to divide the application up into parts or waves. Sometimes folks refer to them as that um, by uh, subject matter disciplines. And so you may do something along the lines of the example we've got here on the screen where you're submitting the application in multiple parts of uh, discrete reviewable units. Um, and and the, the situation here then is you're getting uh, big chunks of that information to the agency sooner and giving them the opportunity to begin their review sooner uh, if they so choose. Um, really where this comes into play is a, a real advantage for folks to consider are, are uh, applications where you may have priority review or, or some other sort of expedited pathway. Um, and you want to take as much advantage of that as possible. And so you're you're looking to get the information to, to FDA in, in those kind of chunks so they can uh, start tackling their review of, of at least parts of the application sooner than they would otherwise if you followed a normal standard timeline. So what are some of the challenges and risks that go with a, a submission like this? Um, first and foremost, uh, you've got multiple moving targets now that, that complicate project, uh, project and timeline management. So rather than just managing one timeline where everything, uh, modules one through five, fits in there, you've got to manage multiple timelines now, whether you're splitting this up into two parts or three parts, um, you're adding to the complexity there. You've got to make sure that you're tracking which documents go into which section. 
uh, and managing all of those timelines, uh, both independently and from a high level, keeping an eye on how things fit together. So just uh, a lot more complexity there. Um, a key thing is you can't just decide to do this on your own. You've got to have FDA buy-in upfront. Um, so uh, it, it's going to be important that you've got a plan that the agency has agreed to in advance on those. Um, another point is that these waves, these parts must be submitted uh, complete. Uh, so, so for example, if you submit a, a part, first part of your submission, and it's uh, the, let's say it's the non-clinical module, FDA's expectation is, is that that is going to be a, a complete unit that they could, if they so choose, uh, begin to review immediately. So that, that means um, their expectation is that, that you're not going to have draft data in there that you expect to, to update and revise in a later submission. Um, they they want to be able to, to tackle it as received. And so that uh, you know, makes it a little challenging to make sure that you can manage your uh, you know, timelines to make that happen. Um, and and a, a big one here uh, that, that we've definitely seen recently is that um, FDA, again, may begin reviewing uh, the, these parts as they're received. So uh, FDA may start sending you information requests related to part one while you're still in progress of preparing part two. Uh, it's not even been submitted yet. You're already getting information requests. So um, uh, it, that adds to the complexity of the, the whole process by you now having to manage how to get those responses in in a timely manner um, within that, that period. So what are some of the su success strategies you, you can uh, employ to deal with this? And I can tell you, um, you, you know, our team, we've already completed two of these submissions this year. We're working with uh, uh, several different clients to, to manage um, new submissions on this front moving forward. And so I can tell you the number one thing uh, is to focus on the details. Uh, you, you know, as I mentioned, you've got multiple timelines uh, running in parallel. Um, a key thing is to keep make sure you're tracking documents uh, on an individual file basis to make sure that um, everything is going into the application where it needs to be uh, and, and on time. It, it's a it's a huge logistical challenge, and you need to make sure you've got somebody on the team, at least one person who's dedicated to managing all of that and making sure that everything is, is well organized so nothing falls through the cracks. Um, uh, strategy number two, uh, agree in a plan with FDA and, and stick with it. Um, FDA typically uh, is open to receiving uh, proposals for rolling submissions at your pre-NDA or pre-BLA pre meeting. Um, there's a guidance out there, guidance for industry on expedited programs for serious conditions. Um, talks about how uh, how and when they'd like to receive those kind of proposals. So make sure that you you first of all are, are planning ahead and include that that kind of request and and supporting information in those uh, meeting meeting requests, meeting briefing packages. Make sure that you get FDA's buy-in on it. And it's uh, very important that um, once you agree to that plan with FDA, you've got to stick with it. Um, FDA is, uh, you know, going to expect you to, to abide by the plan that's agreed upon. So if something changes in your program, the timelines change, where information, it, when, when or where information is going to be submitted, it's important that you make sure that you're consulting with the agency uh, to make sure they're still on board with your plan before you make changes. Um, you also need to build timelines into sure, uh, as I mentioned, ensure that you are submitting final data in each wave. Um, I've definitely seen situations where there are some very specific instances where FDA will uh, be understanding of draft data being submitted with, and, and you know follow-on data um, coming in with with final data. Uh, a good example of that might be um, stability data on the CMC side. So they may accept in an early uh, CMC submission uh, partial uh, stability data, knowing that in your final submission of your uh, rolling NDA that, uh, you know, you'll update with the final stability data. But otherwise, you need to make sure that your timelines allow for you to have final data in, in that submission. And, uh, you, know, you know, as I mentioned, you can and should expect that uh, you may get information requests for those earlier parts. You need to plan, come up with a plan in advance for how you're going to handle those. One of the, the sticky logistical things a lot of folks don't, don't typically consider are uh, sequence numbering for your sequences. You, you've submitted part one as sequence one, you're working in progress on part two as sequence two in your publishing software. You get an information request and now what are you gonna do? Are you going to have your, is your plan gonna be to create uh, and, and submit sequences out of order? 
or are you going to you know renumber sequences so that um, you can submit them in sequential order a lot of times that's going to depend on what your publishing software will accommodate um, our, our global submit publishing software for example will allow us to renumber submissions that are in progress um, so so we can easily accommodate those and, and continue to submit in sequential order uh, just by renumbering things in progress within our software but the important thing is you need to have a plan for that and, and also make sure that you've got bandwidth within your uh, resources to create and produce those responses in the timely manner uh, that FDA is going to expect them to, to come to you. So moving along, uh, you know, the second trend we're seeing are large ECRFs. Um, and um, th the bottom line on ECRFs is that, that we continue to see them ballooning, uh, growing, uh, you know, year over year almost, and certainly in comparison to what a lot of folks may have been used to in the past um, with paper CRFs, uh, we're seeing ECRFs being uh, just thousands of pages in many cases, um, and a significant driver on that is not actually the study data itself, but the audit trail that the EDC, the Electronic Data Capture System, is uh, creating. And, and so, you know, uh, I was just on a client call earlier this morning where, where we uh, had, had mentioned uh, CRFs in, in the neighborhood of 7,000 pages uh, to be expected on a particular study. So um, those can create a lot of logistical problems. Um, those, those high page counts um, obviously are, are going to translate into larger file sizes. Um, and, and those larger file sizes can, can create a lot of problems for folks. Um, you, you know, the, uh, they can be slow. Uh, to, to publish in your publishing software. They're going to take longer to, to QC. Um, they're going to take longer to upload or download from various networks or, or, or even through the ESG. Um, if you've got files that are larger than 400 megabytes, uh, you know, FDA guidance even requires that you, you need to split those up into multiple files. So, so just large files can create a lot of technology and, and logistical challenges there. Um, also, what we, we were seeing in these large ECRFs, that critical nav navigation aids can, can be missing or, or not working properly. And, and, and really what we see is there's a wide range of uh, output coming from various EDC vendors. And, and so um, some vendors are producing uh, ECRFs that are submission ready and can be dropped right into the ECTD structure. Others produce uh, files that require a little more uh, elbow grease and polish to, to make them work right. Uh, for the submission before you can drop them in. And finally, um, you know, occasionally we'll see files coming to us with security placed on them, and, and that presents a number of challenges. First and foremost, it's going to flag a, a validation error that can cause problems uh, when, when you're submitting to the agency. Uh, uh, more often than not, security on a file is going to limit your reg ops team's ability to do any publishing work. So. Uh, whether that's adding or modifying bookmarks, whether that's adding or modifying hyperlinks, uh, adjusting file properties to match PDF specifications, a lot of times that security feature is going to totally prevent our team from being able to do those things. So uh, that, that can present a, a, a major problem. So what are some of the success strategies we've got for, for dealing with large CRFs? Um, I, I've got a number of points here. Really, what I can do, sum them down uh, up to though is plan ahead. And a, a lot of times, folks are not even thinking uh, about these things until they're already. Um, it's already too late. The, the the CRFs are already generated. The studies already closed. And and I would argue that's too late. So my my first point here is going to be to choose your EDC vendor wisely. Um, I, I strongly recommend uh, regulatory folks. Um, you, you know, the the choice of the EDC vendor is usually. Uh, entirely the responsibility of the clinical team. Uh, I'd encourage you to kind of uh, make friends with the folks on your clinical team, uh, stick your nose into their business a little, ask to be involved in the process of selecting the EC EDC vendor, uh, because your, your part of that is you want to see what's the output from their system. What do those ECRFs look like? You want to make sure that what they are producing is going to be something that you can take and plug into an ECTD submission with minimal effort required from your reg ops team, um, particularly if those are going to be files that are thousands of pages. Um, what we've also seen is most EDC systems can be adjusted to produce uh, a submission-ready file. Um, 
they just need to be told what your expectations are. Uh, and, and so again, that's why it's important for regulatory to be involved early in the process, see an example of what their system produces. Um, you, you can take a look at it and compare it against the criteria for what's expected as far as bookmarks and hyperlinks and, and see how it stacks up. And then we, we often encourage clients whenever possible to include the criteria, what your expectations are for uh, how the file is formatted, how it's bookmarked, how it's hyperlinked. Include that in your contract with the vendor so there's no question as far as the expectations of what those deliverables are. Um, this can have a huge cost implication for you at the tail end of your project when it comes to actually building the submission because if these are submission ready files, um, they are, are can be processed by your reg ops folks uh, much faster, much easier. Um, and, and if they're not, this can be a, a very time consuming process to remediate, um, you, you know, ECRFs that aren't optimal. Um, and to that end, anytime we, we do see the issues in a file that, that, you know, it's not bookmarked properly, it's not hyperlinked properly, there are other issues with it. Um, one of the things we always recommend is to go back to that EDC vendor, see if they can regenerate the ECRF um, to, to have the required output, have the appropriate formatting, bookmarks, hyperlinking. It's always going to be much easier for them uh, to, to generate a new file uh, per those specifications than it is for your reg ops team to go through and completely rebookmark or rehyperlink such a file. And so, so the bottom line is uh, for something that regulatory usually doesn't have a big role in, um, I, I really encourage uh, regulatory affairs, regulatory ops um, to, to, again, stick your nose into clinicals business a little bit, uh, get engaged in the planning uh, and, and dialogue early on uh, because this is a major issue that can have uh, cost and timeline implications for you. And last but certainly not least, uh, you, 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 well, actually not last, but well, uh, and another point here is you want to factor in time to quality check. Again, if you're talking about a CRF that's got, um, it, it, you know, as many as 7,000 pages in it, that means that there's going to be a lot of bookmarks. Um, if if two-thirds of that uh, CRF is audit trail, there's going to be a lot of hyperlinks that go from queries back to the, the source data page. And um, it's often forgotten that, that that is a tedious and time consuming process to do a QC of those things. Um, it's very important that you make sure that your timelines account for that. Um, uh, otherwise, uh, you know, this can be a real, real major hit to your timeline at the end. And um, the, the, you know, the benefits of sharing and exchanging information and higher quality data here. I, I, again, bottom line, uh, reg ops, regulatory affairs, uh, and, and clinical need to need to communicate better so everybody understands, um, you, you know, what what each team needs out of the whole process and out of their EDC vendor. So the third trend and the last one that I'll cover before I hand things over to to Rob here are, are just more data sets. Um, what we're seeing compared to, to even what we were doing three, just you know, three, four, five years ago, is that uh, studies are uh, more and more accompanied by data sets and more data sets. Um, you, you know, we, we see studies coming to us with dozens and dozens of data set files. It's not unusual between SDTM and Atom files to see more than 100 uh, data sets and related files coming come with a single clinical study. And so, uh, again, this creates a big headache, and you kind of see the picture we've got here kind of uh, banging your head on your desk a little bit, but um, um, that's a lot of files uh, to be tracked, to be organized. One of the things that complicates this is it, it, your, your data sets, they're CDISC uh, standardized data sets. That means the data sets for each individual study have the same file names, so it, it becomes even more challenging to make sure that the right files uh, are, are received, tracked, and placed in the right place in the study. Um, another thing we see a lot is that the folks preparing the data sets may not always have a clear understanding of FDA's requirements for data sets. And so, so we see folks who are obviously uh, very, very uh, competent and capable at doing the statistical analysis and, and uh, generating the numbers that are important for the, the clinical study report, but may not have a clear understanding of, of exactly what outputs are expected of them uh, to be included into an ECTD submission. And, and so um, that can have uh, some, some major consequences uh, along the way. Um, 
Another thing we see uh, quite often is that there are, are very detailed guidance documents about this, the study data technical conformance guide, the ECTD technical conformance guide, and others uh, provide very clear guidance from the agency on what they expect. And a lot of times we uh, see that folks just haven't even uh, looked at those and, and just don't have an understanding of, of what that is. Um, don't forget the supporting files. You know, In addition to the SAS transport files, uh, the, the actual data sets that, that need to go in the submission. Um, there are other things that, that need to go, go with them. Uh, defined files, and that's usually an, uh, an XML format. Um, style sheets maybe that need to be accompanying the de defined file to make sure it displays properly. Other things like the statistical analysis plan, the study data reviewer's guide. And if you're providing uh, you know, you know, analysis data sets, uh, the program files in, in text format uh, are also files that need to be provided, accounted for, tracked, and, and so on. And uh, the last point here, the, a major challenge here, or, or really more of a risk, is that non-conforming data can result in a technical rejection or a refuse to file. Um, FDA's put out uh, uh, quite a few new validation criteria over the last couple of years about data sets. Um, right now, um, they are, are reviewing those for information purposes only and are not using those currently as a criteria to reject your submission. But, um, you know, every conference or, or, or meeting I've been to recently where folks from the data standards group at FDA have spoken say that, um, you know, in the not too distant future, uh, they're going to flip a switch. Those uh, validation criteria are going to be enforced. And, and um, you know, from what we're seeing from FDA's data, um, that could result in a lot of rejections of submissions. And um, just to illustrate that point, uh, FDA's got data just from Q4 of 2019 uh, on, on NDAs to CEDAR. 58% uh, of non-clinical studies with data sets had some sort of data set validation error. And 26% of clinical studies with data sets had a, some sort of data validation error. Um, the most common error they, they flag also is the ts.xpt dataset is, is not present, which in a way is a good thing because that's probably one of the easiest ones to uh, you know, solve by simply providing a, a ts.xpt uh, dataset with them. But, but those data right there illustrate that there's a lot of folks who are not submitting data sets correctly. And if and when FDA flips that switch and turns that validation criteria on, um, it's going to be a lot of submissions that could be, uh, you know, rejected because of that. So how do we deal with some of these challenges? Um, first and foremost, get your ducks in a row. Um, I, I'm going to sound like I'm, I'm kind of beating a dead horse here because it's a, a reoccurring theme that I'm, I'm mentioning. But you need to make sure that you're organized. Uh, like I said, a lot of files, a lot of them named exactly the same from study to study. It's very important that things are well organized. Uh, to, to make sure, again, nothing falls through the cracks. Um, we definitely recommend, too, that, that you work with an experienced team to produce your data sets and related files. And when we say an experienced team, we say, um, you, you know, we encourage you when you're, when you're finding a partner to help you with uh, statistics and producing those data sets, um, make sure they're familiar with producing these data sets and their files for a submission to FDA. Make sure that they understand which file types they need to provide to you, which file types they should not be sending to you, uh, and, and those kind of things, so that they uh, are giving you what you need correctly the first time around. Um, and, and to that end, you, you want to confirm that all necessary files are provide, provided for every study. Again, it's important to note that um, th there's a lot of files other than just those SAS transport files that need to go in there, defined files and the like. So um, you, you want to make sure that First of all, you got all of those from your, your data partner and that you're providing those to the reg ops team uh, so, so they make, can make sure that they make it into the submission. And then, um, you know, please carefully review and address all validation errors. Um, not every validation error is the end of the world. Um, not every validation error requires um, necessarily required some action. Um, but you need to make sure that you are, are reviewing the validation errors, particularly related to anything data set related. Uh, make sure you understand what they mean, what the implications are. And whenever you can, uh, you, you know, take action to resolve those validation errors, you want to make sure that um, something as simple as a missing TS uh, data set is not the reason that your NDA or BLA filing gets rejected uh, by FDA. 
And with that, uh, I'll turn it over to Rob so he can walk us through some of the other trends that, that we're seeing across uh, our clients these days. All right, thank you very much, Evan, and uh, hello, everybody. I am just going to take control here of the slides. All right, so the uh, first topic I'm speaking about is Health Canada and and uh, CTAs and ECTD at uh, Health Canada. Health Canada has been accepting ECTD submissions uh, for well over six years. Earlier this year, they announced implementation of uh, ECTD for clinical trial regulatory activities. And uh, this stemmed from a successful pilot conducted in uh, 2019. And of course, uh, module one and validation criteria were updated to reflect the new changes. And this is a lot like, uh, as with a traditional submission, Health Canada receives a package and they review it and they issue a no objection letter before you initiate the trial or advance a, a, an amendment to a trial. And as the same uh, with the traditional submissions with ECTD, um, pharmaceuticals go to the thera pro therapeutic product uh, directorate and biologics go to the biologic and uh, radiological radiopharmaceutical radio -pharma directorate. And um, at Syncrogenics, we, uh, we leverage a dynamic electronic tracker to keep track of all the components going into the CTA. And the common electronic submission gateway is a mechanism where you upload and send these uh, submissions for review. And of course, using the uh, gateway is much more advantageous than the old way of uh, sending in a CD-ROM. And the CESG is synony synonymous to the FDA ESG that we all use. Canada leverages the same gateway. They more commonly refer to it as the CESG. Now, some activities are out of scope for using ECTD for clinical trial activities. Namely, an example is a uh, development uh, safety update report or a DSUR. You can see the Health Canada website for more examples and details. And as with any time you transition to ECTD for uh, all additional and subsequent submissions to the same dossier or, cl or clinical tri trial protocol, it must also be filed in ECTD format. And these are just some examples of uh, clinical trial activities that are supported by ECTD. And uh, some challenges and risks we have seen is, uh, the, again, the, the devil's in the detail, planning, planning, planning. It uh, Help Canada, we find, uh, has higher standards and higher expectations. Be mindful of even minor errors. You will obviously need a, a, a gateway account to submit. And uh, Health Canada um, submissions may not always seem to be straightforward. So some of the success strategies we recommend are leverage learnings from other people and um, make sure you abide by the naming convention. That's key. The, uh, I mentioned earlier that the, the module one um, was updated. One thing Health Canada asks for is if you've not submitted before, they ask that you do is test submission and even suggest holding a pre-technical consultation meeting before making your first live submission. And then once you've done that, you can uh, request a dossier identifier after a successful test. Again, uh, Health Canada, has an email address, they're very responsive. If you have questions, you can use this email. And then finally, as Evan mentioned with some of the other topics like data sets and CRFs, make sure you budget in plenty of time. One, uh, before, I, before I move on, uh, as far as submission acceptability, one thing we've heard from some folks at other places are, even if it validates cleanly, you may, get feedback, requesting adjustments or minor changes, and then resubmission. 
And as a side note, before I went to my next slide, I was going to say there's an interim order out there for clinical trials for drugs and devices related to COVID-19, um, which is my next trend. And for clinical trial applications for COVID-19, um, you need to be sure for your CTA that under your application, you indicate this pathway both in your cover letter and in your Canadian 3011 form. So more on that in just a moment. You can see the Canadian website for details on that. And now this is a perfect segue to my next trend, which is uh, COVID-19 and submission trends. Many sponsors have uh, products that have uh, activity against COVID-19. And as a result, several of our clients are uh, exploring treatments and or vaccines. And um, here we've definitely see, seen an impact on clinical research and here are some of the risks we've seen. Obviously, many people are working remote and the pandemic has had an impact on clinical research. For example, um, people overseeing and participating in the trials must adhere to social distancing and other requirements such as wearing a mask. Um, there's a there's an fluid regulatory landscape, but there's definitely a high interest by people and participants in these kinds of trials. National guidelines, local guidelines, they're they're emerging as we speak. But uh, as a former boss of mine once said, no matter what, patient safety is paramount to everything. Some of the success strategies we've seen for COVID-19 trials are make sure you pull in our, all parties. Activity is obviously very brisk, and we're seeing a constant flurry of activity with new possibilities popping up as much as uh, as early as this week, for example. So many people are uh, interested in participating. Watch the guidance. There's frequently changes coming around the world um, and updating to this information, but um, and us, we're seeing every night on the nightly news, this is a hot topic. So be flexible and uh, work closely with your vendors, your partners, your affiliates, and obviously the health authorities. We recommend sticking with ECTD. I don't think paper will be faster or necessarily easier. So um, with that, make sure you foster uh, complete planning. The good news is, is review continues. and the, in my personal opinion, the authorities are to be commended for all they're doing, and our thoughts and concern go out to everyone who is affected by this terrible virus. Uh, the next slides I'd like to share are some closing thoughts, just to summarize, sum up everything Evan and I have shared with you today, is. Uh, one of the most common things we've seen across the board, no matter what region or jurisdiction you're submitting to, make sure you use the correct file formats and abide by PDS specifications and use the correct oftentimes fillable form for the jurisdiction you're submitting to. Make sure you carefully check the validation report for the region you're submitting. And um, sometimes errors that were passed by without regard are now getting flagged. So for example, a medium mail error that used to sail by is now maybe becoming a hard stop. So be very uh, keen to that. And obviously watch the various health agencies' websites as new announcements and come out. If you have the ability to sign up for automatic alerts from that, uh, do that. And uh, finally, if we can help, let us know. And then finally, uh, just in summary, Satara is here to help with uh, your regulatory technology needs. And um, we um, have our Synchrogenics division that has an entire team of regulatory experts that are dedicated to ensuring compliance and a successful execution of your regulatory submissions. The bottom line is, is whether you buy the technology, which is one option, or completely outsource it or work uh, in a hybrid fashion, we're here to help. We're here to simplify your regulatory processes and assure submission success.
Thank you. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Danny for Q and A. Great. Thank you, Robin Evan, for sharing those five regulatory trends with our audience. Before we get into your questions, for the latest industry trends and updates, please follow Sertara on social media. For any questions regarding regulatory technology or services, please contact us at the email address shown on this slide or visit us at sertara.com. Okay, and looking through our questions, it looks like we've gotten a few questions in from the audience. Um, so let me ask this first question to you, Rob. Our first question is, how do you suggest we check navigation specifically to bookmarks and hyperlinks? Do you check them one at a time? That's the uh, the the way that we uh, that has been done it one at a time uh, over time. However, there's some very innovative tools out there that speed it up. It's we have a tool called Crosscheck, which speeds that up and automates it. It lets you do a left right comparison of uh, your 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 source and your destination. So that's one example of an innovative way to confirm your navigation than going through it individually. Okay, great, thank you. And on Evan, I'll throw this question to you. So for a rolling submission, when is it considered officially received? Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, thank, thank you for, for asking that, uh, something I should have touched on earlier. Um, FDA does not consider your rolling submission officially received until they receive the final uh, portion of the application. So, you know, if you split your application up into two or three parts, uh, it's that last part, the, the final submission is when they uh, will consider your application received and, and officially, uh, you know, begin the process of filing and review and everything. Okay, great, thank you. And then I'll just throw this one to you, Rob. Um, so another question in regards to Canadian CTAs, you mentioned using CESG. If I have an account with FDA ESG, do I need to do anything special? That's a good question. No, the, uh, the CESG and the FDA ESG are synonymous, they're one and the same. So if you're a user on the existing ESG, it's simply selecting Health Canada as the center in the drop down to send your submission. Okay, uh, and we're getting a lot of questions in from from the audience. So Evan, I will I will throw this to you and Rob. If you have any um, you know insights, you know please feel free to share. Um, so another question. So each CRO has their own EDC system. Do they have any significant differences? How can we select wisely the better EDC vendor or vendors? Yeah, let, let me let me take a stab at that one. So, so I mean, I think yeah, certainly there are many many EDC vendors out there, and and you're right, a lot of uh, CROs uh, may have a, you know a preferred partner they recommend for for using uh, in those cases. Um, what we have seen in terms of of from a, and I'm speaking strictly from a, a reg ops kind of publishing perspective when I when I say this the you know the the quality of these um, is is really comes down to how they're bookmarked um, and, and do the bookmarks conform to to you know FDA's expectations and and for for those who are familiar um, you'll know what I mean when I say we're we're looking for uh, bookmarks for every uh, domain in there organized by domain and also by visit to, to make it really easy for FDA reviewers to drill down and, and kind of review the, those data. And so the the ones that are, are excellent are the ones that come, the, the bookmarks are very neatly organized under a by domain heading, they're organized under also under a, a by visit heading. Um, all of those audit trails have a hyperlink that, that take you back to the source. Uh, page so you can understand you, you know what was changed uh, in, in each of those instances and really those kind of files uh, your reg ops team can take plug right into the submission with with not a whole lot of additional publishing effort required on the flip side we, we'll see some where where they've made a, a an honest attempt I'll, I'll give them credit for making an honest attempt but those bookmarks it's clear that they were programmed into the software, they were designed and outputted by somebody who was not necessarily familiar with what the end product should look like for a submission. And, and so um, th those are the cases where the, the 
you know, the ECRF is going to require a whole lot of effort from the RegOps publishing team to remediate those bookmarks. Um, and, and again, w when you're talking about files that are thousands of pages, um, that can be a lot of work per file. Um, so, you, you know, I, I don't want to get into kind of naming names of who's good and who's bad because it, it's more nuanced than that. But that's why I really recommend, you, you know, as part of your evaluation of an EDC vendor is to look at a, examples of, of uh, what those ECRFs are going to be and make a determination based on how, how it looks. And, and again, um, we found that, that many vendors are, are able to customize that output. So if their default output is not what you expect, um, you know, it's time to have a conversation with them. Can they uh, adjust this to meet your expectations? Okay, thank you for that, Evan. Uh, and another question, I'll throw this to, to you, Rob. Um, can you provide an example of errors that used to pass but are now being flagged? Do you have processes to check for this prior to submission? Ah, that's a good uh, to, a good question. The, um, what we are seeing is, is like uh, again uh, in the old days, if you had a bunch, it's like a school of fish, a bunch of low airs flying by. It's just they kind of go by unnoticed, or or a bunch of medium airs uh, that uh, might uh, might have been flagged. Um, I um, I'll do some digging in. Uh, and some of the post material we put out here, see if there's some examples. Yeah, I, I mean, I could say I, I know, for example, the the Office of Generic Drugs. Um, uh, you, you know, so we're talking about ANDAs here. They are very, very um, detail oriented, um, and um, they are far more likely to to come back and identify uh, deficiencies in, in in bookmarking or hyperlinking. Um, you know, on, on an individual document basis. Um, so, so they are very detail oriented. They have very high standards over there. Um, and, and so in a lot of cases where if your bookmarks did not uh, exactly correspond with, with uh, PDF specification, uh, other review divisions, other parts of the FDA may, uh, you may never hear uh, any feedback from them about that. But uh, Office of Generic Drugs is a good example of places that they will send things back. They will kick things back if you don't have, um, uh, you know, good bookmarking and hyperlinking. So that that's the first, you know, an example that immediately jumps to my mind there. Um, again, as far as like validation errors, um, uh, again, I, I'd say um, pointing back to the data set question specifically. Um, right now, their flag, you know, the the validation criteria, your validation tool like our our global submit validate will identify things like a missing TS. Uh, data set. Right now, FDA is not using that as a criteria uh, for uh, acceptability. So, so it's basically kind of in a test mode with them. But at some point, they do intend to, to turn that on and uh, actually use those validation criteria as um, a, a you know decision maker for whether to accept or reject. And when they do, you know, based on those stats I was showing earlier, um, there's a lot of submissions that won't make the cut yeah. anymore. Okay. Awesome. Thanks for that, Evan. I'm going to throw this question uh, to you again. Um, so we have another question in regards to our, the rolling submissions. So what are the benefits of pursuing a rolling submission versus a standard review? Yeah, so so again, it's 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 all about accelerating your timeline, which is why to, we are more and more seeing these with um, folks who have some sort of uh, priority review or, or, you know, some other expedited review status with the, the agency. And um, so, so I'll just make up some examples and some dates here for the sake of conversation. But, um, you know, if you've um, uh, submitted your uh, CMC uh, complete module three information in March and you plan to submit non-clinical and clinical in August, um, it, it's very likely that um, you, you know, I've actually seen it uh, with a client we're working with right now, where uh, a very similar situation like that. So they submit the CMC information in March. They're still working on clinical and non-clinical in April. They started receiving information requests from the uh, you know quality folks at FDA with uh, questions about the CMC information. So even though they had not officially 
uh, completed the, the submission of their application, they, they still had not uh, submitted clinical and non-clinical information. FDA was already reviewing uh, the CMC information, sending questions, expecting responses. And, um, you know, and if you compare that to a timeline of a typical NDA where you'd wait until you had everything together, um, that means that the FDA is reviewing and, and kind of resolving issues months in advance in some cases where they would on a typical timeline. So that, that's really where the advantage of a rolling submission can, can help you get an approval ultimately faster. Okay. And then another question, I'll throw this to you, Rob. Um, so a pretty simple question is, you know, the, the abbreviation CRF that we use, what does that stand for for our audience? CRF, uh, we typically say case report form, and historically that was in paper. When uh, with the genesis of electronic data capture many years ago, we put a small e in front of it. So eCRF is electronic case report form. Okay. And then uh, another question. Um, so I'll, actually, I'll get it posed to both of you guys. Maybe Evan, you, you start first. Um, so the question is in regards to the FDA. So we have a statement, uh, the FDA will not begin the review until they have received all the five modules in a rolling submission. Is that true? Yeah, it's actually not true. Um, and, and, mm -hmm. and I, you know, I, I don't have any specifically, you know, special FDA insider knowledge, but I can say in, in years past um, that that did seem to be true. I, in years past, I'd, I, I've worked on uh, a couple of rolling applications and we didn't get any feedback um, until after the final set section was completed but like i said we, we've been working with a client um, you know where we helped them submit a rolling uh, application earlier this year and and again we started receiving information requests related to that first part uh, while we were still in progress so I, i'm not sure what the criteria uh, within the agency uh, may be as to, to how they go about deciding whether they're going to start working on things or not. I, again, I do, uh, my understanding is that it does have something to do with uh, whether you've got some sort of uh, expedited, uh, you, you know, review process associated with your product, but, um, you, you know, actively dealing with a situation now where FDA is asking questions about part one before part two was submitted. Mm -hmm. So I, I know that they do, at least in some cases, get to work on it right away. Yeah, and hi, Danny. I generally agree with everything Evan said. Uh, what might be a point of confusion is, is it's when it's fully received is when it's officially received. So that might be confusing some people, but for everything we've seen, the chunk it up is a good way to efficiently move it along and uh, early on sets the pace. Okay. Thank you. And then uh, another question on rolling uh, submissions, very, very hot topic. Uh, so the question from the audience member is: Rolling NDA submission is dependent. Is it dependent on the project progress or dependent on the FDA request? I would argue the answer to that is is both. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, you know you've got to to be able to um, organize your your you know set up your project in a way that's going to support you uh, making those uh, rolling submissions. And, and you know, as I mentioned. Uh, FDA is very clear. Um, you, you need to have agreement with them in advance. So um, it, it's important that they've agreed to accept your application in a rolling fashion. And it's also important that your project, uh, you, you know, the the schedule of your studies, the availability of your your CMC information, uh, all, all of that stuff uh, needs to align in such a way that you can neatly, um, you know, produce the multiple parts of the application. Right, and I'll echo that. I think what we see is full, honest, open communication is the most effective way to marshal this. We find the, the FDA is so very helpful, um, but it really starts with the sponsor, you know, being, uh, being very communicative and uh, continuous communication to plan, plan for success. Okay, and then just continuing going through the questions. Um, so when it comes to managing ECTD submissions, are there any best practices that you know you guys would like to share to the audience as it relates to um, you know submitting those uh, applications or even reviewing them um, you know within the organization? 
I'll let Rob have a crack at this one first this time. Yeah, so if you, uh, if you, the last couple, the last slide I showed were some very high wave tops on some points, but as far as efficient review is if you use a tool or a technology that allows you to, to work in a common space. For example, we have a, uh, a web review tool that is browser-based, it's browser agnostic. And it's just a very fast way to go in and look at the dossier and not only look at it, but you can slice and dice it by a variety of views, such as regulatory view, and rapidly search and find things. Uh, you, you know, I, I would say a couple other things that come to mind for me. Um, it, it's the 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 drumbeat you heard throughout our our talking points was was just being organized and and having a good tracking tool, and whether that's uh, something in your your RIM system, whether that's an Excel spreadsheet, whether you're using something like uh, Smartsheet or Airtable, um, you, you know, at, at Synchrogenics we track um, everything that's going into every sequence down to the individual file level. Uh, we track when it's received, um, who's it's who it's assigned to, when they complete the various steps in the process with it. So. Um, we are big fans of, of very detailed, very granular uh, planning and tracking tools uh, because when you're talking about, especially you're, you're talking about a marketing application in an NDA or BLA, you could have hundreds, even thousands of files going into them. Um, it, it's very easy uh, for things to fall through the cracks if you're not well organized and, and tracking uh, things in that fashion. Um, another thing that we like to do um, is, um, you, you know, we, we tend to set up a, a kind of plan to receive documents and pages over the course of, of several weeks or months leading up to the target submission date so that, um, you know, there's not pressure on, on anybody to complete everything right at the, the last minute, but we're looking to, to publish uh, QC uh, review and approve things in, in increments over the course of several weeks or months so that the closer we get to the submission date, the less and less the, is remaining to be published. And um, a, a big, a big uh, you know, selling point of that then is the more stuff we have on the shelf approved and ready to go, uh, you know, as we get close to the submission date, that gives us a lot more bandwidth to be able to deal with the curveballs that always come in a project like this. You know, the 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 ISS timeline that slipped and that document's going to come a little bit later or the late breaking stability data or the labeling documents that need to get finalized at the 11th hour. It's a lot easier for us to be able to accommodate those and still maintain uh, the target submission date if, if we're, uh, you know, planning and, and working in a stepwise fashion along. So so th those are just the, 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 the couple of things that come immediately to mind to that question. Awesome. No, thank you, Rob and Evan, for, for that insight. Um, so that will conclude our, our Q&A session. That was the last one. So um, I'd just like to thank uh, our audience for attending our sponsored RAPS webcast today. And I will turn it back over to RAPS to conclude today's webcast. Thank you.